Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome to One Church. Good to see you today. Come on, watch you put your hands together. Well, welcome. Great to have you here. Uh, what an awesome time to be a part of the body of Christ. And uh, we got some folks in the room today. Uh, I'm presently here in Gahanna. We have folks watching right now over at our Northwest campus. Uh, I was introduced this week to a woman named Katerina who has been watching and serving from Bulgaria. Come on, somebody, Bulgaria. <laughs> Katerina, what's up? Katerina uh, has gone, gone to Welcome to One Church, and now she's serving on our online team from Bulgaria. So we love you, Katerina, and all your friends and everybody else. I'm going to come on. We got to, how many of you know we're, we're going to Bulgaria for Jesus? Come on, we can do it. <laughs> Praise God. What a cool time to be able to take the gospel uh, on the airwaves, on the internet, uh, in all kinds of ways. It's just an exciting time. And, you know, we're in this process now of of coming back and uh, you know, we've already opened uh, the Northwest campus now and in the middle of September, we're gonna open up the Gehanna campus and I just wanna invite you to be a part of this comeback, uh, to not only come and attend, but also to serve and uh, to just be a part of this next season of the church. And I just wanna thank you. I wanna thank you for showing up, whether it's showing up watching on your phone or on your television at home or in a coffee shop or physically showing up to one of our locations. Thank you for taking time out of your life, out of your schedule and bringing yourself. And really that's the greatest thing you can bring. More, more than your stuff is bringing yourself. And I just wanna thank you. My, my name is Greg, by the way. Uh, I'm the lead pastor here and uh, one of many people that serve and are a part of this. And, uh, my wife Shaylin and I have three kids and I'm thankful to be a part of this community. You know, I, I had something kind of crazy happen this week. I was uh, in my room sort of working on some stuff, minding my own business. And our middle son, Hudson, uh, is actually, he's on the autism spectrum. And, and part of what he likes to do is he is absolutely infatuated with DVDs. He loves DVDs. I mean, he doesn't even necessarily want to watch them. He just likes to hold them. In fact, we'll take him to like Meyer. He'll, he'll want to go to like Meyer or Target, and he'll just want to get like Aladdin and just walk around the store holding it. We don't buy it. He just walks around like shakes it and everything. And, and we're like, all right, buddy, it's time to put it back, you know, and then we put it back and we'll leave. And, uh, you know, he'll walk around the house holding DVDs. Well, we bought him an organizer for all of his DVDs. So he's probably got like 30 DVDs, and he puts them in the organizer. And so now he started carrying the whole organizer around the house with like 30 DVD. And so uh, the other day I hear him, just this past week, like two days ago, I hear him walking and he trips and falls and drops all of his DVDs. He's eight years old, he's actually turning nine next month. Drops all of his DVDs and then drops the F-bomb, all right? And enunciated it. I mean, it was like, it was like I mean, I like the, like pronounced the on the end, right? And I was like, wow, like he really said that. And so I'm like, okay, we're gonna, we're gonna have a, like a teaching moment. And so, so like I come out of my room and the whole way I'm thinking, this is horrible timing because we're coming back. You know what I'm saying? Like we're coming back to one church. We're opening up our kids ministry. And I'm like, you know, my son is gonna go into kids ministry. He's gonna teach everyone a new word. You know what I'm saying? It's like <laughs> pastor's kids are already like, eh, you know what I'm saying? It's like, ah. <laughs> I'm like, oh, and then, and then it's like, you know, the pastor's kid learned the F word during the quarantine. <laughs> you know, it's, it's like, okay, you know, that, like the kids team, is, <laughs> they're going to be judging me so bad. You know, it's like, come back and say the word and the kids and teach it to your kids and everything. But I still bring them to church, seriously, like. And I'm like praying for grace because I'm like, yeah, I can just see the kids team judging me. And they're like, oh, no, it's cool, Pastor. I'm sure he heard it from Mickey Mouse Clubhouse. You know? <laughs> no, it's, you know, PJ Masks has a potty mouth. You know, everyone knows it. It's well documented. You know, it's like, oh, my gosh, like, what am I going to So I'm trying to think like doing damage control in the teaching moment. And I, I come around the corner and he thinks he's dropped the F-bomb and no one heard him. And he looks up and he sees me and he's like. <laughs> and... um. So I like get down on one knee. I was like, I said, uh, buddy, where did you hear that word? And he said, mommy. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm lying. That's a lie. That's not true. That's not, that's not, Greg, why? Why would you make that joke? It's so inappropriate. Um, he didn't say that, I promise. Uh, my wife's not here today. Um, and uh, 
We'll see if she watched the podcast. You're going to know. Nobody text her. We're going to find out. We're going to test her. But um, no, he, he wouldn't tell me, you know, so I start going through. I'm like, did you hear it here? No, did you hear this person? And, and I'm asking him, and I finally, you know, and he, he's, he's overwhelmed. He's totally overwhelmed. And, he, and he's, he's like, he's like, Daddy, I said the F word. He starts crying. He starts sobbing. He's like, I said the F word. And I was like, I'm like, buddy, you're not in trouble. I just want to, like, we don't say that word. And I just want to know, like, where you heard it. And he's like, oh, I said the F word. He's crying. And, 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 I'm like, and I'm like, okay, okay. Why did you say that word? And he's like, I don't know. He's crying and crying and crying. And so I, yeah, I sat there and I, you know, was like, it's going to be okay. Let's just not say that anymore. You know, he didn't know what it meant, but he knew he shouldn't do it. You know, he knew he shouldn't do it. And as I'm sitting there talking to him, it honestly made me think about, even as like adults and everything, like when we come to Christ, you know, we come and, and we, we bring everything to God. Like the worst stuff, like the things we said that we shouldn't have said, the things we did we shouldn't have done. Some of it were like, I don't even know why. Like, I don't know why I did that. I don't know where I learned that. I don't know where I heard that. But I just know I've been doing it and it's not right. And I, I, I want to not do wrong anymore. So like when we first like come to Christ, we experience this incredible grace. In fact, one of the things that we learn as we mature in our faith is we grow in greater levels of freedom. So, sometimes we apply a very low view of God to God. Like we almost treat God like a dysfunctional relationship. You know, like if you don't marry me, I'll throw you in hell. Or, you know, I'll kill you if you don't love me. Or, or even like some of this like, uh, you know, God is like this schizophrenic father who, uh, man, we better tiptoe around him. We hope we don't set him off. He's probably going to go off. I hope he's having a good day. But if he happens to be having a bad day, he's probably going to drop the hammer. And, and, and so like, you know, a lot of times we have this like very low view of God, and, and, and we learn that we actually have been gi given grace in place of grace already given, that actually when you look at your healthiest relationships, it gives us a glimpse of what our relationship to the Father is like. So ultimately over time, we learn that where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's freedom, and, and so we grow in that. So, but at the beginning, we start with like trying to not do bad things, right? So we're choosing early on, even come to Christ in your 20s, 30s, 40s, you're like, uh, I don't want to, I don't want to do those bad things, and so you're choosing between good and bad. And, and, and I'm going to try to not do the bad thing. and I'm going to try to do the good thing. And, and so when I'm looking at my time and my energy and my money and my focus, it's just, okay, uh, my, my first step is don't do bad stuff. Over time, as we mature, we get to the place where we understand that sin has consequences. And we understand that sin, it's not like if we sin, God's going to not give us mercy or not give us grace. But we understand that sin has consequences we don't want to live with. I don't, I, I'm not faithful to my wife because I'm worried that God will hate me forever if I'm unfaithful. I'm faithful to my wife because I don't want to do that to her. I don't want to complicate my life. I, I want to have a great intimate relationship. I, I don't want to have to walk that journey of, of, of you know, healing. and like. I, I want to just, I, I understand that sin takes you to places you don't want to go and keeps you longer than you want to be there. So now it's not, I'm not choosing between bad and good, although I, I know I could certainly become an idiot and, and go backwards. Now, when we take another step, it's not between bad and good, it's between good and best. Like, like what's the best use of you? What's the best? You're gonna have great opportunities and you're gonna do good things. What is the best? And I think then, when we get to that place, um, we still feel a certain degree of, of pressure. And I would say even a degree of confusion around when you're looking at your limited resources of your time and your energy and your money and you're like, I wanna get to the end of my life and I wanna make sure that I gave my best, my best to the most important things. So we're starting a new series over the next three weeks and we're, gonna, we're calling it Good, Better, Best because I want you to be able not only to get to the end of your life and to look back and go, you know what? I gave my, my best to the most important things. I want you also in the moment, like right now, I want you to be able to enjoy what you're doing and not live with the guilt that you're not doing enough. Most people I talk to, they, even the people that aren't choosing between bad and good, they're choosing between good, better, and best. They live with this feeling like, oh, I'm not doing enough or I'm not doing good enough. Even if you do something great, it's like, well, you did this, but you didn't do that. And it's just like you run around like crazy. In fact, it reminds me of, of this game. I don't know if you guys remember this game. It's called Whack-A-Mole. Come on, anybody remember this game? All right, here we go. I'm going to play a little Whack-A-Mole for you here.
Anybody, anybody feel like this in your life? Okay, you're a mom and you're a, you got your dad and you got relationships. And as soon as I get the child wiped, now I gotta make some food and then I gotta do a call and I got a Zoom meeting and, and I gotta go put out a fire and I gotta solve a problem and I gotta run somebody somewhere and I gotta pay a bill and I gotta, I gotta answer an email. It's just like, ah, whack them all. And, and, and as soon as I whack one, another one pops up. And so I think we live in this anxiety going, now nah, I don't think I can whack all the moles, you know. I, I'm, I'm just, what, what if a mole pops up and I didn't whack it and it was really, oh, doggone it, I just can never get the lavender mole, you know. And this is just life. It's just like, ah, I want to I wanna know that like I'm doing okay because it never feels like I can get to all of it. And at some point we have to decide like how are we going to aim ourselves? How do you shut it off? Thank you, Jesus, shut it off. By the way, the word priority was created in the 1400s. It didn't exist until the 1400s. And in the 1400s, it was singular. The word priority, it meant the prior thing. 500 years later in the 1900s, it wasn't until the 1900s that we made it plural. We made it plural. 500 years later, priorities. And so now we have priorities. Tease. We got whack-a-moles and everything's a priority and everything's important. And now in the information age, I'm aware of all the causes that I can't get to and all the things that I didn't make. And even though I, I, I did good here, I didn't, but I never got to that. And I just don't want you to live like that. And I don't want to live like that. I, and I don't think we have to wait to the end to get it right. I think, I think we, can, we can know now. And I want, so I want to help you with this good, better, best. All right? Um, Here's what we're gonna do the next three weeks. Um, I, wanna, I wanna share with you three things that all of us need to be investing ourselves in. And, and some of this is gonna be the same for all of us and some of it is going to be different for you than it is for me. And as, as I talk over the next three weeks, I want you to think about your time, your energy, and your money. Your time, your talent, your treasure. And all I want you to do today, I want to create a conversation with you and God. And I want you to, through this process, go, does anything need to change? Am I giving what is uh, my best to what's most important? When we think of uh, the, the three things that all of us need to be giving to our time, energy, and money is number one is to God. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Next week, we're going to talk about what I'm going to call our circle. And these are the people that God has put around you. You don't have enough capacity to give to everybody all the time. And what's pretty tragic is if you get to the end of your life and you're like, I gave everything to everybody and the people that I really really should have given to. I didn't. And so we're going to talk a little bit about that next week. And then we're going to talk about our community, our community. And, and these are people that you may not ever know or ever meet. And so we're going to figure out how do we, how do, we do this in a way that with the whack-a-mole goes away and we go, you know, what? I'm aiming myself. My most important things are getting my best. Okay. Um, but today what I want to do is I want to zero in here and I want to start about, uh, about, talking about giving our very best to God. And I, and I want to talk to you about four reasons, four reasons why we give to God. And as I talk today, I want, I want you to think about, like, do you feel good? And maybe you do. Maybe you go, man, I, I really feel great about it. And if nothing else, this is confirmation. Or in one of those three areas, God may be saying something to you about, man, something needs to shift one way or the other. But I want to talk about four reasons why we give to God and why we give to God first, why we give ourselves to God, all right? The first reason we give to God is because giving is an expression of gratitude, honor, value, and love to God, all right? It's an expression of gratitude, honor, value, and love to God. You, you maybe have heard this uh, old adage that you can give without loving, but you can't love without giving, okay? You, you can give without loving. Certainly, I could give with no love, just you give to appease, or you give to get somebody off your back, or you give because you feel obligated to, um, and that's the worst kind of giving. 
you can do that, but you can't love without giving. In fact, if, if you love, it's just easy to give. It, it's not even like you gotta think about it, you just do it. You come up with creative ideas, um, you're sacrificial, and it doesn't even feel sacrificial. You're glad to do it. Um, of, of your time, energy, and your money. You know, recently my, my nephew Brandon got married to um, his, his then fiance, now wife, Bailey, and they asked me to do the wedding and to DJ the reception. Oh yeah, okay, now I, I'm gonna tell you, um, you know, performing weddings, that's cool. DJing the reception's the best. That's really my calling. I'll be honest, like at some point preaching the gospel, I'll be like, okay, uh, uh, I'm, done, I'm time to go do my real calling, which is DJing. I've, I've, I've planning it out. My, when I retire, I will retire into a second career as a DJ. I've already picked my DJ name. It's Greg the Stallion. Don't judge me. Don't judge me. Um, I will be righteous, bougie, and ratchet. All actually, I'm going to have a long, I'm going to have a long, uh, uh, long, don't judge me, a long gray beard with a tight fade gold chain. I'll be driving to Winnebago. I'm going sea to shining sea, and I will be DJing weddings for a lot of money. All right, it's going to be a lot of money. That's how I'm going out. All right, that's how I'm going out. And so, um, so I, I, I did the wedding, and it's like, oh, yeah, for better, for worse, rich, richer, poor, you got it. I do, I do, I do. Okay, cool, reception. All right, bring it in, let's go. And so um, I, I DJ the wedding. I get done, awesome night. Next day, I wake up, I get together with my sister, and we're talking about the wedding. And it hits me, I forgot to get Brandon and Bailey a wedding present. I forgot to buy them a gift, you know. And I wake up, I'm like, oh, doggone it, I need to get them a gift. I forgot to do it. And, and um. I was so caught up in the, the wedding and everything. And so the next day I'm sitting around lunch with my sister. I was like, yeah, you know, I got to get, get them a gift. I need to get them a gift. And she said, oh, you don't need to do that. You don't need to do that. She said, you, I mean, you put a lot into it. You put a lot of time and energy. You know, you, you, you were officiating and you were DJing and you did all this stuff. That's your gift. You can do that. And, and I was like, no, I I want to, like, I want to get him a gift. And she's like, no, you don't need to. They, they, I mean, the registry, they got, I think they got everything they need. They don't need anything else. They're good. And I'm like, no, you don't understand. I don't feel obligated. I, I want to. This isn't like, oh man, I guess I'm the uncle. Oh, I, I guess I better do it so I don't hurt their feelings. I want to. This is my nephew, you know. I gave some time and energy, but man, I want to give him some money. Like, I want to give him some money. I want to do something. No one's twisting my arm. I don't feel bad about it. I want to do it because I love them. This is one of the biggest days of their life. It's not begrudging. This is something I get to do. Like, I want to do it. And so I think when you think of the components of a healthy relationship, you know that giving just kind of pours out of it. And, and this is why in 2 Corinthians 9, 7, it says, hey, each of you should give um, what you have decided in your heart. Like give what you decide in your heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, not begrudgingly, not because you feel obligated. It's like, oh, okay, fine. Here, take it. You want it? No. He said, no. Why? Because God loves a cheerful giver. Why does God love a cheerful giver? The same reason you do. The same reason I do. I don't like somebody giving something, okay, I guess I owe this to you. I, I, you know what I love? I love when my wife gives me a gift and she gets it like two weeks before my birthday and she's like, I got you a gift. Like I got, oh, you're gonna love it. You know, I'm like, okay, that's cool. Uh, you wanna tell me what it is? You want me to wait? And she's like, I don't wanna tell you now. I'm like, no, look, we can wait. She's like, no, I wanna tell you now. I'm like, I like how excited she is. Like, she's a cheerful giver. You know, if I was like, oh, it was your birthday again, here you go. You know, I was like, oh, 365 days, let the countdown begin. You know, I guess I'm gonna have to do this again next year. I mean, that, that's not healthy. Like, something's wrong there. And so, so, like, in our relationship with God, this isn't like, oh, I feel bad, or oh, man, I'm gonna be cursed. Um, this isn't like, oh, you're not doing enough. This isn't like whack-a-mole, okay? This is like cheerful. I got to tell you this whack-a-mole, back to the, these stupid moles. Is, is, uh, this is how Satan messes with me, okay? I'm like you. I'm trying to, I'm trying to do this right. You know, I want to be a, a good guy, and I want to be a good husband, good father. I want to be a good pastor. I want to be a good leader. I want to be, you know, all the responsibilities that I have. But here's, what I'll, here's how the enemy will mess with me. I, I might take a day and spend the day in God's word, most of the day I'm in the Bible, and I, I feel like I'm getting these revelations from God. I feel really connected, and, and so I, 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 I hit the Bible mole, and then, <clears throat> and then I'm walking away from this awesome moment, and the enemy's like, oh, yeah, so you were in God's word all day, huh? Well, good job, Dad. You didn't even really spend any time with the kids today, you know? 
Real man of God, huh? Yeah, I wonder if the people at one church knew well, you weren't really with your kids, you know, and they're saying the F-bomb now. Uh, you know, it's like, hey, you know, good job. And then it's like, hey, you know, that's right. I better get over here with the kids. And I spend the day with the kids. It's like, oh, real man of God, huh? You didn't even pray today. Uh, no prayers? Oh, just all family time, huh? Okay, well, I guess God got a back seat today. No prayers for you. And then I spend time the next day praying. It's like, oh, good husband you are. You and Jesus having convos and your wife has something she's got to say and you don't even care. And I go over and do that. You know what I'm saying? And, and, and you live in this condemnation. It's like, eh, we're not meant to live. The enemy, Satan is the accuser of the brethren. Satan wants you to live in condemnation. The healthy relationship with God is freedom. It's freedom. It's, it, it, it comes from gratitude and honor and love, and it just flows out of it. Here's what I'm going to say. If, if you're in a place where you're not feeling generous with God in this space, instead of proceeding with bad energy and unhealthy energy and giving out of manipulation or guilt, maybe start to build the relationship. Maybe start to dig into understanding God more. Maybe spending some more time in prayer and communion and connection so that you go, yeah, I want it to flow out naturally. Because when you're in that place and you're going deeper in that relationship, good things will flow out. All right. So the, the, the first reason why we give to God is because we're expressing gratitude, honor, love, and value. Um, by the way, in 2 Samuel 24, David King David, he goes to, to uh, make a sacrifice to God. And it, it says that um, in chapter 24, it says that he went to this threshing floor of this guy named Arana. And Arana owned this threshing floor. He owned a bunch of stuff. And of course, David shows up and Arana's like, oh my goodness, the king's here. And David says, well, I want to make the sacrifice. And so Arana basically says, okay, you can have my threshing floor. You're the king. Take my threshing floor take the oxen, take everything for the sacrifice. He tries to give everything to David. He says in verse 22, let my Lord, the King take whatever he wishes and offer it up. Here's oxen, burnt offerings, the sledges, the, the ox yokes for wood. Okay. He tries to give everything to him. And it says in verse 24, it says the King replied to Arana, watch this. He said, no, I insist on paying. I insist on paying you for it. I will not sacrifice to the Lord my God burnt offerings that cost me nothing. I'm not going to give God something that didn't cost me anything. Not because I feel obligated, but because this is how I express honor and love and joy. And when I have hard-earned money or I have precious time or I have limited energy and I give it to God, I'm showing him honor. I'm showing him love. And it comes from a cheerful spirit. All right, number two uh, reason why we give to God is to store up our treasures in heaven. It says, Jesus says in Matthew 6, 19 through 21, don't store up your treasures here on earth where moths can eat them and rust can destroy them, where thieves can break in and steal. Store your treasures in heaven. Don't, don't store them here on earth. Store them in heaven where moths and rust cannot destroy and thieves don't break in and steal. Verse 21, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So, He's saying, look, if you want your heart to be somewhere, you put yourself there. You put your time, energy, and money there. Like, I want you to think of it like this. Your heart, sometimes your money follows your heart. Sometimes your heart follows your money. Sometimes it's proactive. Sometimes it's reactive. For example, we've all given our time, energy, and money reactively. Um, your, your kid does something or your niece or nephew or something, like does something really sweet and you're like, okay, here's a lollipop. There you go. You know, it's like, oh, you did that so good. Here's a reward. Um, we've all heard something where our heart was provoked, our emotions were stirred and we said, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna give to that. I'm gonna be a part of that. that that's close to my heart. That's reactive and that, that's good. I mean, I think we should, like sometimes we see something and we react to it. But then there's proactive, which is saying, I want my heart to be here. I'm gonna invest here. Um, I, I, want my, I want my heart to be in the mission of God. I'm going to give into the mission of God. I'm going to give myself into the mission of God. I'm going to pour into the, this matters over here. I'm not going to give reactively. I'm going to give proactively. I'm not going to wait to be asked. I'm going to jump in and go because I want my treasure. Where your treasure is, your heart is. And sometimes we lead with our resources and our heart follows behind. And sometimes God stirs our heart and our resources come in behind. But what we want to do is, is, is put our, store up our treasure in heaven. You know, I, I talk to people all the time. I feel this myself, that in this world, they're, they're, they're troubled by it. You know, you look around, you're like, man, 
it's crazy what's going on, you know, not, not, not just with coronavirus, but with culture and, and everything. It's like, man, I, man, I wish I could kind of pull myself out of it. Well, one of the ways we pull ourselves out of it is being heavenly minded. If all I do is I just focus on the here and now and what's going on, everything in front of me, I'll become very short-sighted and I'll become earthly-minded. This is why when Paul talks about don't, don't conform to the pattern of the world, don't think like the world, you got to elevate your thinking. Part of how I do that is by storing up my treasure in heaven, it elevates me into something bigger, something that the SMP can't mess up, something that Dow Jones can't touch, so something that brings a different kind of return, an eternal Return. So, so storing my treasure in heaven, that's a, the second reason why we give to God. The third is to break the bond of greed, to break the bond of greed. I want you to think about this. Nobody, nobody is born generous. <laughs> nobody. You've never met a generous baby. <laughs> you ever had a baby pop out like, mom, how can I help? It just doesn't happen. In fact, you've never met a generous toddler, okay? And some of you are like, oh, no, my kid. No, no, your kid's not generous, okay? They're just not. They have their moments that they're sucking up to get something, okay? There's no, you, you, you don't, you're not born generous. You see somebody, oh, he's so generous. She's so generous. She developed generosity. Generosity is something you develop. It's not genetic. It's something you develop. Our flesh pulls us to greed, and greed, the greedy version of you, and by the way, I have a greedy version of me, the person next to you has a greedy version of them, and you have a greedy version of you. And the greedy version of you is the worst version of you. Um, it's, the part, it's the version of you you don't even like. You like yourself better when you're generous. And the only way that you break the bond of greed, the, the, the bond of get, 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 the consumer mindset, the only way you break it is by give, give, give. Give, give, give. I've got to give of myself. Um, I, I, I love the, the quote by Maya Angelou. Maya Angelou said, I found that among its other benefits, giving liberates the soul of the giver. Among its other benefits, giving liberates the soul of the giver. Because now when I'm breaking the bond of greed, I can enjoy the simple things. I can enjoy the little things. When I'm greedy, I become this bottomless pit of consumption that I just think I need a bigger one. I need another one. I, 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 need, I need to upgrade. I need to level up. I, I need more, 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 more. And it just, it, it's just like a trap. It's a trap. And, and so when I break that bond of greed in my life, uh, now what happens is I can actually enjoy the littlest thing, the moment, the simple thing that God's given me. You know, Jesus says this in Matthew 6, 24. He says, you can't serve God and be enslaved to money. You can't serve God and be enslaved to money. And he was saying that, really it was quite provocative because he was saying that to these Jews who were enslaved to the Romans. And so in essence, he has this picture in front of them like you see the Romans and how they've oppressed you. Money can do that same thing. This inanimate object, this, this dollar can go from an inanimate object and it can animate and become a slave master to you. It can actually have a bond on you that can oppress you. And he said, don't, you can't serve God and money. You gotta break that bond and it's not going to break itself. Your flesh will always draw you magnetically to greed. And so one of the reasons that we give is because we don't want money animating on us. We wanna keep it inanimate. We want to master it, not have it master us. First Timothy 6.10 says, the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. And some people craving money have wandered from the true faith and pierced themselves with many sorrows. Ecclesiastes 5.10, watch this. It says, those who love money will never have enough. How meaningless to think that wealth brings true happiness. All right? So, so we give because it's expressing love, gratitude, and honor to God. We give because we're storing up our treasure in heaven. We give because we break the bond of greed in our lives and we're wise enough to know that anybody, rich or poor, any socioeconomic situation, you can become greedy. I don't want that bondage in my life. And so we, we, we give to increase generosity, to develop generosity in our heart. 
And then the fourth is we give because God blesses everything you give to him. God blesses it. God can't bless the thing you, you hold on to. Anything in your life, I'm, I'm going to tell you this straight up, anything in your life that you want God to bless, give it to him. When I say give it to him, I don't mean hold it and pray, and, and pray for it. <laughs> I mean give it to him. You want God to bless your marriage? Give it to him. You want God to bless your kids? Give them to him. You want God to bless your career? Give them to him. You want God to bless your relationship? Give them to him. You want God to bless your attitude? Give it to him. And yes, you want God to bless your money, your resources, your energy? Give them to him. And anything you open your hand and you give to God, that's what he blesses. You know, it says in 2 Corinthians 9, 6, remember whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. Whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Think of sowing, sowing seed. If I have this seed in my hand and I hold it, it can't, it can't increase. It can't even be what it's supposed to be. I got to open my hand. I, I heard about this recently and I had to go do some investigation. I actually tracked down some video. I, I heard about this method of catching monkeys, all right? And, and these monkey traps, you can, you can fact check me on this, you can look it up. Um, people that are, try to trap monkeys, what they do is they'll take a, um, a coconut and they'll cut a hole in it and the hole is small enough or it's big enough for the monkey to slip its hand in but it's so small that when the monkey grabs and makes a fist, it can't pull its hand out. And so what they do is they take a coconut. In fact, go ahead and roll this video. And this is an actual video of somebody catching this monkey. And, and they cut this hole. And inside of the coconut, they actually place items inside of the coconut that the monkey wants. So you see this monkey, he's put his hand in the coconut. And, and he's trying to pull it out. And he cannot pull his hand out of the coconut. So the whole time he's trapped within this. And all he's got to do is let go pull his hand out and he can go wherever he wants, but he stays bound to where he is because he's got his hand in it. And in this particular video, this guy, um, this monkey gets his hand caught and a, a young boy comes and he, he's got his hand in there and the monkey won't take his hand out. And so the man is like, he's a, a, apparently a good trapper, <laughs> not a mean one. And so he goes up to the monkey and, and he's like petting this monkey and he's like, you know, let go, just let go. And the monkey, oh, they won't do it. And he's like petting his arm and he's like, he's speaking to him in a like foreign language and he's telling him like, relax. And over time, eventually the monkey like opens up his hand and he pulls his hand out and he starts licking his hand. It's like he's like injured his hand because he's holding so tightly to this stuff that he wants inside. And when he pulls his hand out, he starts licking his hand, the man who found him takes the coconut, and he dumps out the stuff in it, and he pulls it, and he hands it to him. And the monkey now has his like, and I'm sitting there watching, I'm like, dang, that's me. <laughs> that's so me, you know, I'm like a monkey, dude. Like how many times I've been holding on to something, like I want this so bad. Maybe it's even become an idol for me. It's become something that is so important, maybe even more important than God, and God's like, man, I wanna bless it, dude, but you're holding it so tight. You're trying to do it your way. And, and if you'll just let go of it, will you trust my plan? And when I say I'm gonna bless it, it might mean I'm gonna 10 exit or it might mean I'm gonna negative 10 it. I'm gonna take you where I want you to go. Some of you, God might bless you by moving you out of your career. But I lost my job, God, where are you? I'm blessing you. You gave it to me, I wanna reposition you. And if you'll just quit white knuckling the thing and you'll let go of it, let me take you where I want you to go. Will you trust the beautiful relationship that you have with God, that he's for you? And that if, if you'll, you'll let go, he'll bless it. He'll bless everything that you give him. So this is why we, we, we give to God. We give to, to love and honor God and to give him value. We give because we, I don't want all, 
my energy, my time, my money to just be for this world. And when I die, it's gone. I'm store up my treasure in heaven. I want to be heavenly minded. I want to transcend this world that we're in now. Um, I do it to break the bond of greed in my life. I don't like the greedy version of me. And I know I can become greedy. So I, I want to give to break that bond. And I want to give because I want God to bless my life. I want God to bless what I have. And so I give it, I let go and I give it to him. Jeremiah 17, seven says, blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord, whose confidence is in him. So here's what I want you to do. I wanna circle back to the very beginning. Where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. No manipulation, no duty, no obligation. No, uh, I guess I have to, because it's my nephew. I guess Jesus died on the cross. The least thing I can do is serve in the kids' church. You know, so I guess I better, you know. No, 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 no. I want you to sit back and look at your life. And I want you to look at your time, your energy, your money. I want you to, I want you to look at what are you giving to God? Are you giving your first to God or is God getting your leftovers? of your time? Is he getting your leftover time? Well, if I have a little bit of time left, I'll do something for God. Is God getting your bad energy? Your leftover, ah, if I have any leftover. Is God getting your leftover money? You know, after I've paid everybody else and I, I got my Starbucks with cotton candy in it and, and three squirts of, you know, whatever, estrogen, uh, the, you know, once I drink, then, then, you know, if I have anything left over, you know, I might get the Lord. I mean, come on, are, are, you, are, are you putting God in the first, first place? Number one, have no other gods before me. Put me, number one. And, and from a place of joy, are you giving God your first? We talk about good, better, best. I just don't think you'll regret anything that you give to God when you give him your best. So let's do this. Before we pray, I wanna think action steps. Action steps, three of them. First one, make sure God is your priority. It's not plural, it's singular. God, you are number one in my life. Assess your life. Be honest about it. Is God your priority? Number two, give God first. Give to God first. 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 And then three, pray about what or how much. Lord, what do you want me to give out of my time, energy, money? And then do it gladly and don't ever again get caught in this stupid whack-a-mole and don't look up and go but I'm not giving as much as her she's I didn't give as much as him don't worry about that what's yours to give what's God want from you God wants to build a relationship with you with you so allow him to speak to you let's just take a moment let's pray and as uh, as we sing a little bit of worship here together just allow God to speak to you very personally and practically right now